What is the principal stress space? Again, all these are engineering tools. Tools that engineers, mathematical or geometric tools, that engineers have constructed in order to visualize with our senses the stress state, how the stress changes, etc. So engineers said, OK, for every stress state, if I take a solid, I produce some stresses, I get one point, I get the stress state, I know that at this point can be characterized by three principal stresses. There are three principal stresses at this point, OK? And if I take another point, there will be three principal stresses different, but there will be three principal stresses too, different. If I took, take this point, there will be some other different principal stresses. So they say, why? Why don't we construct a Cartesian system in which the axes are, instead of x1, x2, x3, we take sigma1, sigma2, sigma3. Okay? So if now in this system, which is called the principal stress space of the higher Western world, stress space, don't forget ever that we are using the convention sigma1 greater than sigma2 greater than sigma3. So we are occupying a certain portion of this space, not all the portion of the space, right? Anyway, imagine that you have a stress tensor. The stress tensor at this point, the stress state at this point. I have three principal stresses. OK, I take sigma 1, I take sigma 2, and I take sigma 3, and this gives me one point. So every stress state can be characterized by one point in the stress state, in the stress space. And the, and the other way around. So every point of the stress state, which corresponds to three principal stresses, can be representative of a certain principal uh, st stress states in, in certain points. So that is what, what is the, 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 the stress states. And the state in which, first it has an advantage. Look, the stress state in general has six components. In the stress state, since it's, it's a tensor, symmetric tensor, it can be characterized by six components. Look, this, if I want to think of this, I have to consider in, this, in, the, in all the stress state six components, dif different components. And we are not used to think in six di dimensional spaces. We can dr draw in two dimensional space, we can visualize, we can perceive three dimensional space, but beyond that, I don't know anyone that is able to physically understand what would be a four-dimensional space, a five, a fifth-dimensional space, and a six-dimensional space. So the engineer said, well, let's work in the space that we can understand. We can understand three-dimensional spaces. <coughs> <coughs> so we take the principal, the uniquely defined principal stress states for every stress state, and we work in that specific stress state, which is the higher Westergaard, which is that. So that is a very important space. And plasticity is very, very related to this space, because we are going to work in this, in this space. Look, interesting points on this space. The bisect, this is the, you know, every stress state has eight octants. So if I just consider three, I can consider the first octant, x1, x2, x3, greater than 0. Then x1 greater than 0, x2 uh, smaller than 0, and x3 greater than 0, the second octant. So I can divide the space in, so to say, so to speak, eight different cubes of infinite, infinitesimal size, which all coincide in the center. This is what I call octants, octants of any three-dimensional space. First octant is that, sigma 1 greater than 0, sigma 2, and sigma 3 greater than 0. And of course, I can trace the bisect trace of this octant. So the, 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 uh, the, the straight line that it's equidistant of the three stresses. What is that? Is typically x1 equal x2 equal x3, which is that line. This line is the, called the bisector of the first octant. Important. So, and somehow it's a line in which it's it has the same component in the first principal stress, the second component in the second principal stress, and the third component in the third principal stress equal. So that, we know what is that. 
that is a hydrostatic stress state. So all hydrostatic stress states will be placed in this bisector, in this by, by in this bisector, right? So this is called what we call the hydrostatic stress axis. So now we have the concept of the stress space and the bisector of the first octant, which is physically identified as the locus of all possible hydrostatic stress axes, which is that. By the way, the, the, the direction of that is just by, uh, from that, if we want a, a unit vector n who uh, is oriented in the directions, is the three components have to be equal, the norm has to be one, so finally that one over square root of three and here and here is what corresponds to the direction or to the uh, unit vector in the direction of the hydrostatic stress axis. Moreover, the octahedral plan, octahedral plan. So at every point, at every point of the uh, hydrostatic stress axis, we can trace a perpendicular plane, right? A perpendicular plane. So that is called, we don't know that as pi, is the octahedral plane, octahedral plane, okay? So we have two concepts now. The hydrostatic stress axis, equation sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3, and the octahedral plane, which as any normal plane, it can be just, uh, uh, it's normal, has to be 1, 1, 1, so the equation of this plane can be proven is sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 equal constant. The constants, different values of the constants, define what is the distance of the origin, we're going back to that, uh, of the octahedral plane, plane with respect to the origin. So now we have two geometrical measures, very engineering, you know. First, the hydrostatic axis, and second, the octahedral plane, which is, don't forget, normal, normal to the hydrostatic axis. Okay? The equations are that. Okay, so now we are going to talk about distance. Okay? Distances. So, okay, I have one point at the stress space, which corresponds to some stress state, and then, of course, there is one octahedral plane that passes to the point, so that means that it intersects the, uh, uh, the hydrostatic axis in a, in a rectangular, in a uh, 90 degrees angle, and now, given this point, so that is the point where the representative of our stress state, okay? So now, I want to compute that distance and that distance, okay? We can do that, geometrically, by equations, analytically, whatever. So we define two magnitudes. So that distance is, by definition, term tau octahedral, octahedral tau, tau. It's in a scalar, because it's a distance, it's in a scalar. Why, uh, by the way, not just tau theta, but a square root of three times this distance is tau octahedral. So tau octahedral, the octahedral stress, uh, the, the octahedral shear stress, the octahedral shear stress is this distance divided by square root of three. So that is one. Second, that distance, so the distance of the intersection of the octahedral plane passing to the point with the uh, uh, hydrostatic axis, point A. This distance that somehow measures, we'll see what measures that, is called square root of three times sigma octahedral. Okay? So through that, we have defined two new measures, what is called the sigma octahedral and the tau octahedral. Very important, by the way. So what is sigma octahedral? So far, it's just one over square root of three of that distance. What is tau octahedral? is 1 over square root of 3 of this distance, okay? Now in numbers, well, if the coordinates of this point is sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, it's not very difficult to show that square root of sigma octahedral, so that distance, is the square root of the mean stress, sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3, which, by the way, is an invariant. So finally, we find out that what we have defined as sigma octahedral is just the mean stress. So, in other words, 
if I know what, or if I have the representative point of a stress state, and I just want to compute what is the distance of the intersection of the octahedral plane passing through this point pi with the uh, hydrostatic axis. If I want to know the distance, I have just to compute the mean stress, so from now on we are calling that the octahedral stress, times, times uh, the square root of 3. Right? Second, if I want to compute the tau octahedral, I just can solve this, I mean, square triangle. Okay? So, uh, you see that the, 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 this distance square I plus this is equal to this distance square plus this distance square. So now I know that, I can compute that. I do the operations. And then I obtain how, what is the value of this tau octahedral. This tau octahedral is that square root of two thirds times the second invariant of the sec of the, the variatoric tensor. Anyway, what is important here is the, mean, the physical meaning of that. So somehow, you know, uh, tau octahedral means multiplied by three, which can be computed in that way, measures that distance. And sigma octahedral, which is the one we have seen before, multiplied by square through the root of three measures this distance. Now we are going to see what is the information that is provided by knowing these distances. Okay? For instance, imagine that we have a pure spherical stress state, hydrostatic stress state. So the stresses are hydrostatic, that means that the deviatoric part of the stresses are zero. Okay? If the rhetoric part of the stresses are zero, the second inv invariant of the stresses are zero. And if the second invariant of the stresses are zero, you look, tau octahedral, tau octahedral is zero. So, what we know is that for pure hydrostatic stress status, states, the octahedral stress is, is zero. What is logical? We said, we said that the all hydrostatic stress states state here. So for, for, for one point that is hydrostatic, we trace the octahedral plane. Okay, that's the point, A. What is the distance of this point with respect to the representative point zero? Because the point is at this, okay? So that is consistent. In certain way, that says, well, if that is not different, if tau octahedral, octahedral is not zero, what does it measure? What does it measure? It measures how, f how, how much the stress state differs from an hydrostatic stress, sta uh, a stress state. Okay? So if we have, in for a stress tensor, tau octahedral equals zero, what does that mean? That the stress tensor is hydrostatic. If Tau octahedral is very large, very large. That means that the stress state is very far from being hydrostatic. So that means that is far from hydrostatic. So tau octahedral now, we can realize that it measures, it measures the uh, degree of deviatoricity of the stress state. How far, how big? How big is the deviatoric part of the stress state in a single in a single number? Okay. About the sigma octahedral. Look, now let's consider a case in which the stress state is purely deviatoric, purely deviatoric. So, how much is the mean stress? Zero. If the mean stress is zero, what does mean that uh, what is sigma octahedral? Sigma octahedral. I just recall that is the mean stress. So what does it mean? That this plane, this plane, the octahedral plane passing through the point, has a distance to the origin, which is zero. Okay? So that means that if the octahedral, the octahedral stress is zero, the stress state is purely deviatoric. So we can say, in summary, that the locus, the locus of all the stress states, which are purely spherical, is the hydrostatic axis. So, in those, for those cases, tau octahedral is zero. The locus 
of all stress states, which are purely deviatoric, so no, uh, no hydrostatic components, is the octahedral plane passing through the origin. Because then, this distance, which is square root of sigma octahedral, which is stress root of sigma mean, si uh, mean stress, and in that case, since the pure deviatoric stress is zero, that means that this distance is zero. Okay? So yeah, you are starting to see that it's relevant, the values. This value, sigma octahedral, and tau octahedral are scalars, but they tell us a lot. The relative measure of sigma octahedral with tau octahedral inform, report on how, how much the tensor is spherical and deviatoric. In the limit case, if sigma octahedral is zero, the stress state is, can you say? If sigma octahedral is zero, what is the stress? How is the stress state? Can you say? Deviatoric. And if tau octahedral is zero, how is the stress state? Hydrostatic. And if tau octahedral is much larger than sigma octahedral, essentially the stress state is deviatoric. If tau octahedral, if sigma octahedral is much larger than tau octahedral, that means that, that the stress state is typically, is dominantly hydrostatic. You see how intelligent is that? Just a couple of numbers say a lot, a couple of scalars, about the info of information that we engineers need to identify the stress state.